Hey ladies and gents, uh, I want to talk about encephalitis and how to navigate the medical system if you think you have it. I'm going to try to keep this really simple. Um, I've done a few takes now and I've just kind of gotten lost in the sauce and it's and it became too complicated and I already have cognitive problems and so going through this because um, I have autoimmune encephalitis, going through this is quite difficult. Um, so the more takes I do, the more simplified I have to make this. But you think you have autoimmune encephalitis, what do you do? I see a lot of people on Reddit who don't know where to start. Um, they don't know what to do. They're scared. They have these weird things going on with their brain. Um, sometimes very hard to describe. Some things are extremely difficult to describe. Um, they don't know what to do. So just a real quick to cover two different terms. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain and encephalopathy is any sort of neurological uh, abnormality. Uh, that is nonspecific. So it could be Huntington's disease. It could be Parkinson's. Uh, it's anything that they, they don't know what it is, but there's some sort of abnormality happening in the brain, whereas encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. Encephalitis can be caused by a viral infection. So you could have inflammation of the brain that's caused by an, uh, an, a current infection. That would be infectious encephalitis. Often first-line treatment for that would be a ciclovir. Autoimmune encephalitis is a different animal. Usually autoimmune encephalitis includes uh, the creation of autoantibodies by B cells that attack your brain. They attach to receptors on your brain and they cause dysfunction and damage. So that's autoimmune encephalitis. And that can be caused by adverse medication reactions, infections, severe stress, and things like that. Again, encephalopathy is a blanket term for any sort of neurological dysfunction. Encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. Step number one, go see your primary care physician. They will do a neurological workup. It's going to be limited in comparison to a neurological workup by a neurologist. Um, but they'll do a neurological workup and look for any physical signs such as hyperreflexia, tremors, um, nystagmus. And then they can put it in their notes so that if they give you a referral to a neurologist, then they can transfer those notes along with you to the neurologist when they make that referral. It's important to emphasize neurological problems in this appointment, such as cognitive difficulties, confusion, tremors, uh, along with stark personality changes noticed by family members. You might have had, had insomnia and things like that. It's important as well to maybe consider bringing a family member to kind of back up these these things. Um, they can help, you know, back up the fact that, you know, you've really been acting different these the past month. These things have been happening. It's been really strange. They it sounds like a neurological condition going on with the confusion, the tremors, the stark personality changes, these weird symptoms you're having. Um, the weirder they sound, honestly, the better. But I would avoid uh, psychiatric sounding terminology such as anxious and depressed. While autoimmune encephalitis can cause anxiety and depression uh, organically, and it can also cause anxiety and depression because you're scared about your current situation or you're dismayed about your future, uh, Encephalitis is rare. Psychiatric problems are not. So if your primary care physician is listening to you describe your symptoms and they hear psychiatric problems, they're going to push you down the psych path. And that's something you don't want if you think you have encephalitis. So for example, when I was talking to my primary care physician, I, I really thought I had encephalitis because I had so many weird symptoms. And I was describing, you know, I'm like really depressed and I'm anxious and all this stuff. And I was like, do I, do you think I have encephalitis? And she said, no. And she asked me if I was a very anxious individual. So she thought I was a hypochondriac. Uh, so this is kind of something you want to avoid being targeted as, as a hypochondriac. So I'd avoid uh, psychiatric sounding terminology such as anxious and depressed, at least at this appointment. Again, encephalitis is rare. Psychiatric problems are not. At this appointment, your goal, your single goal is to get a referral to a neurologist. So emphasize those neurological problems. Uh, and strongly request a referral to a neurologist. And you'll hear me say this probably multiple times throughout this uh, video. Be your own advocate. If they say no the first time, don't take no as an answer and just buckle under it and go home. You say, I've been really having these problems. I'm scared that I'm going to have damage to my brain or I have a tumor or something. I would really like, uh, or something's going wrong with my brain. I would really like a referral to a neurologist, please. Um, so keep pushing until, excuse me, just had a weird thing happen, it happens when you have autoimmune encephalitis. Um, keep pushing to get that referral to a neurologist if they're stubborn. 
Um, so that's your one goal. That's your only goal at your primary care physician appointment is to is to express those neurological changes um, or problems that you've experienced and get that referral to a neurologist. Before you go to a neurologist, I'd highly recommend getting a clean psychiatric report from your local psychiatrist. Uh, this would look like going into your psychiatrist's office and they do a, a comprehensive psychological exam and they're looking for symptoms of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, for example. Once they determine that you don't have a psychiatric issue, a primary psychiatric disorder, they can write up a letter, and I would, I would emphasize that you request them to write up a letter emphasizing that your problems that you're experiencing are more, are more likely due to a neurological problem than a psychiatric problem. This is something you take with you throughout your medical journey. So you're going to get, after you get uh, your CUPCP and you get a clean psych report um, and you get that referral to a neurologist, you're going to go see a neurologist. This neurologist is going to do a more comprehensive neurological exam looking for those physical signs of, of abnormalities in the brain because you can have physical manifestations uh, that are related to abnormalities in the brain and brain structure or dysfunction or damage and things like that. Uh, they will perform that workup, and they will perform labs as well, serum labs, uh, and a lumbar puncture, hopefully. Again, you want to be your own advocate, so if they don't do a lumbar puncture or they're not saying they're going to do one, you want to strongly request that you want to do a lumbar puncture. Um, and specifically, you want to do a lumbar puncture with an autoantibody panel. So a lumbar puncture will bring, back, bring you some basic labs, such as protein or glucose and things like that. Um, but also that autoantibody panel is extremely important because it's going to tell you whether or not you have an antibody that's attacking your brain by binding to receptors and causing neurological dysfunction and damage. Um, so if you get, you know, for example, they'll do a lumbar puncture and they'll send out the spinal fluid to Mayo Clinic. They'll they'll uh, do an assay and look for any sort of uh, autoantibody. And for example, you might get back NMDA receptor. NMDA receptor um, antibody as positive, and that's a huge help because that means that you have antibody positive autoimmune encephalitis, and it's going to make your journey a lot easier. Unfortunately for me, I did not have an autoantibody come back positive. However, Mayo Clinic discovers new antibodies, autoantibodies every year. So just because you don't have an autoantibody come back uh, positive doesn't mean you have don't have autoimmune uh, encephalitis caused by a, an autoantibody. So you want to get that lumbar puncture. You also want to request uh, an MRI. They'll probably do this like right away anyway. But MRI with and without contrast. Don't worry about the gadolinium. I know there's some hypochondriac people who are worried about the gadolinium. Don't worry about that. Um, the gadolinium dye that they uh, kind of put into your vasculature when they're looking for uh, lesions in your brain. If you deny the the um, contrast, um, your MRI is going to be borderline useless. So don't deny the contrast. You need you need an MRI with and without contrast. You're also likely to get um, an EEG, and so they can do an overnight EEG at the hospital. But more likely, they're going to do a one hour EEG uh, so that's sleep deprived as an outpatient. So that means you're not going to be at the hospital. That's going to check for any sort of signs of seizure activity. All of these things are, are going to be trying to find any sort of abnormality that points to neurological dysfunction. Because any sort of, you know, when you get an antibody back that's positive, then you have specific specificity. You have um, NMDA receptor positive autoimmune encephalitis. You can say that with, the uh, neurologist can say that with almost uh, certainty when you get an uh, autoantibody back that's positive. That was just an example of a specific antibody that's quite common. Um, but even if you don't get that back, something like seizure activity in the brain, high protein in your spinal fluid, um, lesions on your MRI, they can be nonspecific, which means they, they don't necessarily specifically apply to encephalitis, but they can point you in the right direction. From there, you want to take any sort of abnormal labs with you. And I would I have a binder full of all my labs, all my appointment notes, all the notes I made for the appointment. Um, and I would request a, a printout from uh, the records, records department just to have for your own documentation so that nothing is lost. And from this neurologist, uh, 
you take whatever information you can. And um, oh, one thing I want to bring up is they're going to do a drug screen on you. So be be mindful of that. They're going to test for amphetamines, benzodiazepines, cocaine, al alcohol, barbiturates, uh, marijuana, opiates, and fentanyl. Now, more commonly, I'm assuming most people are going to be testing positive for marijuana. Whether or not your neurologist applies that to your current condition and, and thinks that it's causing some of your symptoms, that's up for debate. Um, it's up to whoever your neurologist is. But you might want to do a wash-up uh, period. Um, right here it says in my lab notes, it says THC metabolites may be detected for one to, to three days after a single exposure, but may remain positive for up to 30 days with ongoing use. So keep that in mind. You might want to have to do a washout period for three three weeks or so, so you don't um, so that doesn't come back positive. From there, you're going to take all your information and you're going to get a referral or ask for a referral to a university hospital where they can be do a more thorough examination, more thorough labs, um, and and uh, give you treatment. Now there are. are many different types of treatment and they kind of escalate as you go on. First line it would be, um, and bear with me, my cognition is kind of slowing down here. Um, for example, uh, I got corticosteroids and that helped bring, bring me out of psychosis. So that was an IV infusion. When I, when you hear the word infusion, that means it's into your vasculature, usually over a few hours or something like that. So corticosteroids, um, IVIG, IVIG is extremely expensive, so um, it's usually easier to get if you have something that's popped up on your labs or something like that that shows some sort of abnormality, and your doctor can make an appeal if you're if you're if IVIG is not covered for encephalitis on your plan. Um, my doctor did like three appeals because it wasn't covered in my plan, but they gave a case for why it might be. Uh, advantageous by providing citations to a bunch of literature that shows that yes, IVIG can be effective at treating encephalitis. So um, corticosteroids, IVIG, both infusions, then second line therapy is usually uh, rituximab and uh, cyclophosphamide. I don't think I'm missing anything there. Uh, there are some niche experimental medications such as intrathecal met methotrexate, um, but more commonly, you're going to get the corticosteroids, IVIG, rituximab, and cyclophosphamide. Uh, the further along you go, the harder it is to get it. So it was very difficult for me to get rituximab. Um, it was very difficult for me to get IVIG, actually, because I had such little documentation or um, information that there was something going on with me. And uh, cyclophosphamide can cause has risks of secondary cancer in the bladder as well as uh, can cause cystitis of the bladder. Um, so doctors are very wary about giving out cytoxin or cyclophosphamide. Uh, I still haven't had it. I think I would benefit from it, but I still haven't had it. So to kind of paint the whole picture here, encephalitis is inflammation of the brain. It can be caused by an infection, which is usually treated with a cyclovir. Autoimmune encephalitis is a rogue, inf uh, ro rogue immune response where autoantibodies attack um, your brain, causing neurological dysfunction and damage. Encephalopathy is a blanket term for any sort of dysfunction in the brain and is not specific to inflammation or encephalitis. You're going to go to your PCP. They're going to do a neurological workup. You're going to emphasize any neurological problems, and you're going to downplay any psychiatric-sounding problems, even if this is accurate. Encephalitis is rare, psychiatric problems aren't. So you don't want to get kicked down the psych path. You got to get a referral to a neurologist. Consider bringing a clean psych report from a psychiatrist to the neurologist appointment. They will perform a workup in labs, including a drug screen. Um, this is a good time to talk about a lumbar puncture, an MRI, and an EEG. From there, you're going to get referred to, or you should request to get referred to a university specialist. Usually, you're going to start at the bottom. So, uh, you know, even if you get referred to the top immunologist of a university, they're going to schedule you with the MS specialist. So more, most commonly, you're going to be scheduled with an MS specialist. If they can't help you, then they might refer you up the chain to the neuroimmunologist. But usually they're kind of the first line of defense so that the neuroimmunologists don't get like overboarded with a bunch of um, patients that may not have encephalitis or an actual immune condition. 
So you're going to get a referral or you should request a referral to a, a university hospital to be seen by a specialist. And from there, um, you can get treatments such as corticosteroids, IVIG, rituximab, and cytoxin. Um, let me just make sure I'm not missing any um, I'm sorry, I'm not missing any uh, treatments for encephalitis. So first-line therapies are going to be intravenous methylprednisolone, which is the IV steroids. Um, IVIG, oh, plasmapheresis, where they do uh, plasma exchange. They, I've had this, and it wasn't effective, unfortunately, because my encephalitis is not antibody-mediated. It's T-cell-mediated, um, which means it's, uh, it's a different lymphocyte, T-cells, um, that don't produce autoantibodies less common by a huge margin. Uh, but plasmapheresis, they'll put a tube in your jugular vein or your carotid artery, I believe, and uh, they'll exchange your plasma over about five to, or uh, well, over about 10 to 14 days. Um, and this is to get rid of uh, any autoantibodies in your serum or in your plasma. And then there's rituximab and then there's cyclophosphamide. So it goes intravenous methylprednisolone, which is the steroids, intravenous immunoglobulin, which is a pool of antibodies that is uh, infused into your vasculature. This can help neutralize any autoantibodies um, in your serum. Then there's plasmapheresis to remove any autoantibodies in your serum. This is usually temporary. The relief is temporary because your body will still produce autoantibodies. Um, so it can generally be seen as a rescue therapy if you're having acute symptoms. Then there's rituximab, um, which depletes, uh, excuse me, cognition is falling apart here. Uh, then there's rituximab that depletes B cells. Um, so it de basically depletes, well, it depletes B cells so that uh, they don't create autoantibodies. Then there's cyclophosphamide, which acts both on B cells and T cells, uh, as, along with uh, other factors of the immune system to reduce the inflammation and immune response. And then there's also Cellcept or mycophenolate motophil, which suppresses the proliferation of B and T cells. Uh, usually this is used as a, um, um, usually this is used as a, um, shit, sorry. Usually this is used as a maintenance medication after you've gone into remission. But in my case, that was not the case. They uh, used it as one of the mainline medications after they figured out that I wasn't responding to rituximab, which depletes B cells, and I wasn't responding to plasmapheresis that gets rid of autoantibodies. So they're like, oh, it's not B cell mediated, it's T cell mediated. You don't have any autoantibody mediation going on. So they put me on cell set, which depletes uh, or inhibits the proliferation of B and T cells. So I get the re I've had a relief because it stopped the, the division of T cells that uh, was attacking my brain. Um, and still is probably, um, I'm certainly not in, rec in recovery yet. Um, so that's, that's it in a nutshell, guys and ladies and gentlemen. So to go over everything one more time, cephalitis is inflammation of the brain. Autoimmune encephalitis is when the immune system attacks the brain. PCP is going to do a workup on you, emphasize those neurological conditions, down, downplay the psychiatric sounding terminology, such as anxiety and depression. Um, Encephalitis is rare. Psychiatric problems are not. Get a referral to a neurologist. Before this, see a psychiatrist to get a clean psych report so you don't get kicked down the psych path. Get a referral to a neurologist from your primary care doctor. They're going to do a workup. They're going to do labs. Um, request a lumbar puncture specifically with an autoantibody panel. Um, request, if they don't do it automatically, an MRI and an EEG. If you get an autoantibody back, see if you can get a PET scan done. Um, PET scan is more sensitive for for detecting inflammation than an MRI. Remember, they're also going to do a drug screen. So if you're smoking marijuana, you might want to do a washout period of about three weeks to, to um, give yourself the best chance of a clean drug screen. From there, you're going to request a referral to a university hospital um, where you'll be 
seen by someone who's more specialized in neuroimmunology, such as an MS specialist. While an MS specialist is not specifically there to treat encephalitis, they do treat MS, which is an autoimmune condition. Um, and so they're going to be more able to determine what's going on based on your labs and symptoms. From there, they may kick you up to somebody higher up the chain to um, uh, someone who's not an MS specialist, but an actual neuroimmunologist, where they'll be able to to do more lab work and things like that to get down to the bottom of things and maybe offer um, treatment options for you. Sometimes they'll do empiric treatment. What this means is they're doing treatment that they don't know if you have encephalitis, but they're going to do treatment on you just to see if you respond to it. And your response to medications, um, in, my, um, uh, in my experience, it was corticosteroids, and that relieved a lot of my symptoms. So I could go to other doctors and say, hey, I had all these symptoms, and so I got corticosteroids and it relieved it. And so that kind of points them in the direction of like, okay, maybe it's this. So for example, this is my kind of flow chart. I had psychosis, I had weird psychiatric problems going on, then I had psychosis, then I had I had tremors in my hands and things like that, hyperreflexia. Um, then I got corticosteroids and that pushed me out of psychosis. Then I uh, <laughs> then I got uh, rituximab from a or then I got a referral to a uh, university hospital um, where they saw everything that was going on. They saw my spinal tap lab, saw there were some abnormalities there. Noticed that I had improvement from the corticosteroids. And so they prescribed me rituximab. That worked temporarily because it has downstream effects on T cells, but um, they thought it might be B cell mediated. So they did plasmapheresis as well. Plasmapheresis was a failure, so they put me on Cellcept um, and IVIG. So that's kind of like how things went down. And that took three years. So it sounds like it was a quick trip, but it wasn't. I saw a lot of neuro uh, neurologists along the way. Um, who were of no help to me. Uh, one neurologist in particular said, I bet you think, I bet you feel like you're already dead. And I told him, yes, I, I feel like I'm already dead. And then he kicked me to the curb. I was like, you son of a bitch. Who says that to a patient? Um, it's crazy. So you may run into road blocks. You may run into road bumps. You may run into doctors who don't want to help you, doctors who are pushing against you. You got to be your own advocate. You got to recognize that not all doctors know everything. Um, and you may have to see multiple neurologists before you get to the bottom of things. Okay, I hope that gives you some idea of what to do. Uh, I, I just see a lot of people having trouble figuring out where to go when they think they have autoimmune encephalitis. Okay, that's all my brain can handle for today. So hope that was helpful, and I'll talk to you guys next time.